A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought you by Shankar AIS Academy for the day 28th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion. See today we are going to discuss nearly 7 news articles. Okay. And along with that we have prelims practice question in which I had discussed 3 different topics via question. So you can keenly observe each and every topic discussion as well as the prelims practice question discussion and enhance your preliminary as well as your mains preparation. Now without wasting much time, let's get into the first news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. See this is the text and context article and it is talking about a new term called blue bugging. It is related to a hacking technology. So let's know about it now. I said it is a hacking technique. So first you have to know what is hacking. Generally hacking means gaining unauthorized access to data in a system or computer. Here the weakness in a computer system or network are identified and then exploited. And this is usually done to gain unauthorized access to personal or organizational data. So the term you should remember is unauthorized access. See the person involved in hacking is called a hacker and they can hack the passwords or infect a device with malware or spy on emails or gain a backdoor access to one's activities in a computer. By doing this, a hacker can steal your money, personal information, then confidential information, etc. etc. Since like this, hacking is associated with a cyber crime, many think hacking is always a malicious activity. It is not so. Because there are different types of hackers like the black hat, white hat and grey hat. The type depends on their motivation and whether they are breaking the law. So the one with the malicious intent and breaks the law, they are called the black hat hackers. On the other hand, ethical hackers are called the white hat hackers. Because in ethical hacking, even though the hacker identifies a weakness in computer systems, they do not exploit it. Rather, they devise countermeasures to overcome such weakness and improve security. So you can see that both white and black hat hackers are the two extreme ends whereas the grey hat hackers fall in between these two. So now coming to the topic that is given in the news article which is the blue bugging. Basically this blue bugging is a technique that allows skilled hackers to hack into bluetooth enabled devices. Through this, they get access to mobile commands on Bluetooth enabled devices that are in discoverable mode. See discoverable mode is a state within Bluetooth technology integrated devices that enables the Bluetooth devices to search, connect and transfer data. So when you switch on Bluetooth in your mobile, you are making the device to be in discoverable mode. Okay. So through blue bugging, what the hackers do, they either eavesdrop on your private conversation or bug your phone. That means the device can be remotely controlled. And this is what allows hackers to intercept or reroute communication. Since they have remote control of the device, hackers may send and read text messages. They can also place or monitor phone calls. Most importantly, they can do all this without leaving a trace. So this is how the process goes and a hacker attempts to pair with the victim's device via Bluetooth. In this moment, blue bugging has started. Now once a connection is established, the hacker installs a backdoor or malware to bypass authentication. Here the malware does the job that is it gains unauthorized access by exploiting a vulnerability. So as soon as the hacker gains access, he or she can essentially do what the device owner can do. Understood? And what you have to remember is a device with discoverable Bluetooth connection is vulnerable to blue bugging attack. But blue bugging can vary from one device to another since it depends on inherent vulnerabilities. So if your device has no Bluetooth protection, it is susceptible to attacks. Another interesting fact is this attack is often limited due to the range of Bluetooth connections. See, Bluetooth connections have a range up to only 10 meters. So the hackers need to be in a 10 meter range to carry out a blue bugging attack. But attackers have a solution for this also. See, they can use booster antennas to widen their attack range. 
Therefore, if your phone or laptop is Bluetooth enabled, be careful. After listening to what is blue bugging, tell me whether it is black, white or grey hat hacking. You can post your answers in the comment section. And that's all regarding this news article. We saw about an important hacking technique that is the blue bugging that is evolving nowadays. See, since it is currently in news, you might have a preliminary question based on this kind of current topics. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this image here. It provides a picture from the annual Kalanga Mela. This Mela is in Dehradun and Mela in Hindi means fair or festival. So in this discussion, we will see about this festival and the reason behind it. See, this Kalanga Mela is organized every year at the Kalanga War Memorial. Yes, you are right. The festival is related to a war. It is celebrated in the remembrance of Gorkha warriors who bravely fought against the British. It particularly remembers their valor in the battle of Nala Pani. Before saying about the battle, know that the festival involves many cultural events like kukri dance, parade, band shows, etc. Another fact to note is that the Gorkhas of Garhwal and Kuman Himalayas consist of various communities. They came from diverse regions of the Nepal at various point of time. But now they are residing as an ordinary citizen of India. Historians agree that Gorkha or Gorkali is a name of the community that aggregates various races who internally distributed at numerous valleys of Nepal Himalaya. That is why in Indian context, the term Gorkha or Gorkha in general apply to the persons of Nepal origin. Now let's come to the topic of interest here. That is the battle of Nalapani that happened in the outskirts of Dehradun. It happened in 1814 and as I said already, it is fought between the Gorkhas and the Britishers. See, the British army marched towards Dehradun to occupy Nepali territory. The territory was situated in Garhwal and Kuman region. It was between two major rivers, Ganga and the Emuna, and was occupied by Nepali forces. Okay. See, the British infantry no, comprised of about 3,500 soldiers with heavy artillery and they were under the command of Major General Robert Gillespie. On the other hand, the Gorkhas were led by the General Balbhadra Singh Tappa and the Gorkha infantry had 600 soldiers. You can see the difference of number of soldiers, right? But the Gorkhas fought nearly six times the size of their regiment. Some sources even say that 600 Gorkhas and their families fought the British. That is even women and children were part of the battle. These Gorkha soldiers defended the Kalanga fort and they defended over six weeks without food or water. This bravery and landmark incident is what celebrated in the Mela. This helps the current young generation to get to know about the Gorkha history and culture. See, but after the six week long battle, the Gorkhas lost. This surprised the British. Why? Because with the mighty regiment British thought they can end the battle in just a couple of days. So the Vela, grit and determination of the Gorkhas impressed the British. To acknowledge the bravery, the British themselves built the memorial. We have to agree that it is a great honor when the enemy erects a memorial of their opponent. See, it is even considered the world's first memorial erected by British army for their opponent. See, the memorial is also known as Kalinga War Memorial and the battle is also known by the name Anglo-Nepalis War or Anglo-Gorkha War or simply Gorkha's War. After seeing the bravery of Gorkhas only, the British even raised the Gorkha regiments. As you know, these regiments are still part of the Indian army and are endowed with gallant history full of sacrifice and chivalry. So that's all regarding this news article. See, through this news article discussion, we saw about the Kalanga Mela and why it is celebrated. Yes, it is celebrated in the event of Kalanga War, which is otherwise called as Kalinga War. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See, have a look at this news article. The news is that a bust of Mahatma Gandhi will be inaugurated at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Know that the term bust literally means a piece of sculpture representing the head, shoulders and upper chest of a human body. Okay, 
and the bust of gandhi ji is going to be gifted by india and it will be inaugurated next month in the un that is during india's presidency of the un security council see there is also another gift from india which is now on display at the un headquarters see that gift is a black stone statue of surya the sun god and this is dating from the late pala period know that the statue was donated to the un in 1982 by the former prime minister indira gandhi so this is all about the news article given here and in this context let's learn about united nations and the relation between india and the un before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference just go through it Now let's start with the origin of United Nations. See during the course of the Second World War, the Allied powers led by the USA, former Soviet Union and the United Kingdom had started planning an organization. Why they planned such an organization? See the Allied powers felt that such organization could act as a post-war peace institution. Also, the organization was planned to replace the League of Nations. Know that the League of Nations was founded on January nineteen twenty at the end of the First World War. Okay, now coming back, then in August nineteen forty one, the then U.S. President Roosevelt and the then British Prime Minister Winston Churchill signed the Atlantic Charter. This provided the basement for post-war peace organization. Then a series of conferences was conducted at various places to discuss various ideas and proposals of the organization. Finally in early 1945 the USA hosted the San Francisco conference in that conference the charter was finalized and signed and that charter established a new organization and that came to be known as the United Nations so this is all about the origin of UN now let's see some more facts about the United Nations see the United Nation is an international intergovernmental organization It was established on 24th October 1945 with 51 countries as its member nations. See UN is currently made up of 193 member states and every year we celebrate 24th October as UN Day because UN was set up on that day in 1945. And know that the charter that was signed in 1945 is acting as the constitution of the United Nations. See the charter lists the purpose of the UN. Then it also lists the principles which is guiding the conduct of both the United Nations and its member countries. And finally, the charter also lists out the principal organs of the UN along with their composition and powers. So this is a brief about UN. Now let's see about the purpose of UN. See the UN has four main purposes. Let's see them one by one. First day the foremost purpose of the UN is to maintain international peace and security through collective measures. Second day the UN has to develop friendly relations among countries and that relationship should be based on the principle of equality and self determination. Then the third purpose of the UN is to achieve international cooperation in the economic, social, cultural and humanitarian fields. Finally the UN has to encourage the respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. So this is all about the purpose of the UN. Now moving on to see the principal organs of the UN. See to promote the goals of peace and cooperation, the United Nations has six principal organs. They are the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, the International Court of Justice and the Secretariat. Note that the Trusteeship Council has ceased to play an active role in the UN system because The purpose for which it was created was fulfilled. Remember, the Trusteeship Council is only inactive and it was not removed from UN organization. So this is all about the organs of UN. Now we will see about the relationship between India and the UN. See, India was the founding member of the United Nations, and India had participated in the historic UN Conference of International Organization at San Francisco. The conference was held from 25th April to 26th June 1945 and at the conclusion of the conference India signed the charter of the UN on 26th June 1945 and as we all know this charter only established the UN so India is credited to be the founding member of the UN then India stood at the forefront during the United Nations struggle against colonialism to you know that india was the co-sponsor of the landmark 1960 declaration on un 
See, this declaration was aimed at granting of independence to colonial countries and peoples. This ceaseless effort of India has helped the UN to put an end to colonialism. Then, India has a long and distinguished history of service in UN peacekeeping missions. Note that India has contributed more personnel than any other country. Since 1948, more than 2,40,000 Indians have served in 49 UN peacekeeping missions. This was established around the world and this portrays the role of India in peace process. And as we all know, India is currently one among the 10 non-permanent members of the UN Security Council. So know that in past, India has served seven times as non-permanent members in the UN Security Council. See, during its last term, that is in 2011 to 12, India chaired the UNSC 1373 committee, which was concerned about the counter-terrorism. Then, India also chaired 1566 working group, which was concerned about threat to international peace and security by terrorist acts. So, this signifies the India's effort on ending the terrorism worldwide. Then, India also strongly advocates for the expansion of the Security Council and improvement of its working methods. See, India in collaboration with other like-minded countries actively participates in the efforts to push forward the intergovernmental negotiations on the question of reform and expansion of the UN Security Council. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article discussion. See, through this news article discussion, we quickly recap to some of the important leftover points of the UN facts. So far, we wouldn't have touched those places. So in today's discussion, we made it a point to discuss some of the important facts and then we covered the India-UN relationship. See, these points you know, can be used in your mains to enhance your answers because these points are in general and can be used to address any type of United Nations versus India relationship. And with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. It says that India had invited Bangladesh as a guest to the G20. See, the significance here is that out of all the neighbors, India has invited only Bangladesh as one of the 10 guest countries. Okay. And as we all know, India is going to assume the presidency of G20 from December 1 onwards. And because of this action by India, the ties between India and Bangladesh is expected to strengthen. And this is all about the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about the economic relation between India and Bangladesh. See, Bangladesh is not only the largest trading partner of India in South Asia, but it is also one of India's leading export destinations. See, this is evident from the trade value between India and Bangladesh. See, India-Bangladesh bilateral trade has witnessed notable growth. To be precise, the trade had almost tripled, that is from $3.4 billion in 2010 to $9.8 billion in 2018. Know that during the last decade, India's trade with Bangladesh witnessed faster growth when compared to the rest of the world. Even during COVID-19, that is in 2020, the bilateral trade between India and Bangladesh showed more resilience when compared to other countries. For example, India's trade with the world declined by 19.8% during COVID, while with Bangladesh, no, it declined only by 5.5%. Then in 2021, India's exports increased from 1.4% in 2010 to 3.5% in 2021. See, this is all about India's export to Bangladesh. Know that the major exports from India to Bangladesh include cotton, cereals, fuel, vehicle parts and machinery, and mechanical appliances. Now coming to Bangladesh exports to India, see this has also increased. It stood at 3.3% and India is the 8th largest export destination. On the other hand, if you take China, it is ranked as the 15th largest export destination with a share of just 1.75% in Bangladesh export. Apart from this, India and Bangladesh are a part of the South Asian Free Trade Area, SAFTA. So, they have preferential treatment in terms of tariff concessions in each other's market. But there exist several non-tariff barriers that hamper the realization of the full potential of India-Bangladesh trade relations. See, according to Bangladesh, 
two specific concerns are there regarding its exports to India. The first one is the new Indian customs rules that stipulate the verification of certificate of origin from Bangladesh. And the second one is the anti-dumping duty imposed by India on imports of jute products, hydrogen peroxide and fishing nets. See, these concerns should be addressed because China is capturing the Bangladesh market by flooding it with cheap exports, investing aggressively and extending credit lines for various strategically important projects. So, to contain China in Bangladesh, India should take steps. And it is very crucial because Bangladesh is a neighboring country to India. See, it is one of the important export destinations for India. And it helps in the connectivity of Northeast. So, keeping all these in mind, India should take actions. Okay, so that's all regarding this news article. See, through this news article discussion, we quickly revised the India-Bangladesh economic relations. See, this will be really helpful to address any type of mains oriented question regarding the India-Bangladesh relations. Also know why this much importance is given for Bangladesh. With these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See, take a look at this news article. It talks about the issue of restrictions imposed by the Union Government on the implementation of National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, that is the Narega Act in Telangana. Concerns were mounted by the state of Telangana saying that the curbs imposed by the centre might defeat the very purpose of the act. See, there are specific activities covered under the MG Narega for only which the funds given by the centre can be used for. So, the Telangana government has contended it saying that this will lead to the purpose of the act getting defeated. So, this is all the essence of the news article given here. In this context, let's learn about the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Scheme in detail. See, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act 2005 is an Indian labor law and social security measure that aims to guarantee the right to work. So, what is its aim actually? It is to enhance the livelihood security in rural areas. How will they do that? They will be doing that by providing at least 100 days of wage employment in a financial year to every household whose adult members volunteer to do unskilled manual work. Okay. And in addition to this, there is a provision for additional 50 days of unskilled wage employment in a financial year. And this is in drought or national calamity notified rural areas. Okay. And know that section 3 clause 4 of the act allows the state governments to make provisions for providing additional days beyond the period guaranteed under the act. But it has to be done from the state government's own fund. Understood? And here note that this act is only limited to the rural hinterlands of our country and not to the urban areas. Now, let's see the history behind the act. See, the act was first proposed in the year 1991 by the then Prime Minister of India, P.V. Narasimha Rao. And it was finally accepted in the parliament in the year 2006 and commenced implementation in 625 districts of India. And based on this pilot experience only, Narega was expanded to cover all the districts of India from April 1, 2008. Okay. See, the statute is hailed by the government as the largest and most ambitious social security and public works program in the world. Not only the government, even the World Bank appreciated in its World Development Report 2014 by terming this program as a stellar example of rural development. Okay. And see, there are certain conditions for providing employment under the Act. The conditions are... That employment is to be provided within 5 km of an applicant's residence and minimum wage are to be paid. If work is not provided within 15 days of applying, applicants are entitled to an unemployment allowance. Thus, we can understand that employment under MG Narega is a legal entitlement. See, MG Narega is implemented mainly by Gram Panjayats of the areas across which the work is allotted. Here, the involvement of contractors is completely banned. Labor-intensive tasks like creating infrastructure for water harvesting, drought relief and flood control are the preferred mode of providing employment under the MG Narega Act. 
See, the nodal ministry which is tasked with the implementation of the scheme is Ministry of Rural Development. So, these are some of the important facts that you have to know about this act. Now, let's see the outcomes coming out of the implementation of MG Narega. See, MG Narega helps in providing economic security and creating rural assets. And apart from this, Narega can help in protecting the environment, empowering the rural women, then reducing rural urban migration and fostering social equity. So, these are all the best outcomes that we can get from the MG Narega scheme. Not only this, MG Narega also has the potential to reduce the migration of labor from rural to urban areas. So, this will help in avoiding urban crowding. So, this is all about the scheme you have to know. I have mentioned all the facts in this discussion. So, make note of each and every facts. It will be really helpful in attending your preliminary type of questions. And you can also quote this MG Narega scheme as an example of social security scheme provided by the government in your main answers. Okay. So, with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, have a look at this news article. It talks about a rarely discussed issue. In India, whenever a discussion is initiated around population, it always revolves on the issues of high population and how to reduce it. But this editorial here tries to address a problem which is less talked about in terms of demographic discourse in our country. Yes, the editorial talks about the issue of how the southern part of India is underprepared for its depopulation phase. Here in this discussion, we will learn about the present population status of India, then the issue of overpopulation and finally about the term depopulation and the challenges associated with it. See, this is an important topic for your mains examination. The syllabus relevant to this news article is also highlighted here. In this note, GS1 paper, Population and Associated Issues is directly mentioned in your syllabus. So kindly make note of all the points which we are going to discuss in this news article discussion. It will be very useful for your mains examination. Okay. With this, let's start our discussion. Firstly, we look at the present population status of a country. Currently, India is having a population of approximately 1.4 billion people. As per the article, population of India will move over that of China in next year. If the projections mentioned by the author becomes true, India will become the most populous country in the world in the year 2023 itself. Here note one important fact, the global population reached 8 billion during this month. In the last 1 billion, around 177 million was contributed by India alone. Putting it simply, India contributed nearly 17.7% to the last 100 crore population of the world. This is the highest contribution of one single country to the last 1 billion population of the world. Now, let's see the average age of the Indian population. See, India's median age population is 28.4 years. When we look at the Japan, the median age there is 48 years. From this, we can see that India's population is relatively young. With this comes the opportunity of demographic dividend and economic growth. See, the economic growth potential of the young age population can be tapped only if we are able to provide jobs for everyone in the working age. So, this is all about the present population status of India and its median age. Okay. Now, let's see some of the problems associated with this overpopulation. See, first problem is the increasing demand for ecological services like food, water, energy, which will ultimately result in more emissions. See, environmental degradation is the first major problem associated with overpopulation. Secondly, in a country like India, overpopulation will lead to vicious cycle of poverty. More the children the poor household produces, more the chances that they are not provided with necessary education. See, if the children born in poor households are not provided with necessary education, it will lead to generational poverty. This is the second issue of overpopulation. Thirdly, with increase in population, there will be encroachment into the natural habitats of the world. See, this will ultimately result in pandemics. See, COVID-19 is a perfect example of how wild animal 
and human interaction will lead to pandemics. So these are all some of the problems associated with high population growth in our country. Now let's shift our attention towards what is this term known as depopulation. See the term depopulation refers to the substantial reduction in the population of an area. See the article says that India has reached the replacement level fertility rate with only few states left behind. Now what does this term replacement level fertility means? See it is a level of fertility at which a population exactly replaces itself from one generation to the next. See generally in developed countries the replacement level fertility can be taken as requiring an average of 2.1 children per woman. Okay, so this is what we call it as replacement level fertility. See the reason for India reaching the replacement level fertility rate is said to be rising incomes and greater female access to health and education. So this is all about depopulation and the reason behind it. Now coming to the important part of a discussion. See, parts of India have not only achieved replacement level fertility but have been below the replacement rate for so long that they are at the cusp of real declines in population. Here, the author refers to the states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Author further says that Kerala has reached the replacement level fertility rate in the year 1998 while Tamil Nadu has reached it in 2000. Even though reaching replacement level fertility rates, states in India are not having the necessary conversation in this regard as like the European countries. See the author says that in the next 4 years, both Tamil Nadu and Kerala will see the first absolute declines in the working age populations. See this will ultimately affect the economy of the state. And other than this, there will be a huge dependent age population who will be directly relying on the small working age population. This will be a serious concern for the southern states which needs an immediate policy action. So now coming to the challenges which may arise because of depopulation. Firstly, the author says that this depopulation will lead to skewed sex ratio among the southern states. See the reason for this is that families with at least one son are less likely to want more children than families with just one daughter. Secondly, this reduction in population will lead to technical jobs made automatically not replaceable in South India. This is due to the fact the major migrant workers from the northern part of India to the southern part of India do only non-technical jobs which leaves the technical job market in South India under stress. So this is the second major challenge as per the article. Thirdly, this depopulation might bring out the anti-Muslim discourse in the population debates. See, this is due to the fact fertility rate of Muslims is slightly above the fertility rate of Hindus. But the point to note here is that fertility rate of both these communities are fastly converging in India. So these are the three challenges put forward by the author which may arise out of the depopulation phase which is taking place in the southern part of our country. Right now it is taking place. Okay. So that's all regarding this news article. See through this news article we had seen about the current population status of India and we saw about the challenges or the difficulties that we face due to overpopulation. But there are also depopulation that is occurring in parts of India that has to be noted. And we also saw three challenges that occur due to depopulation. So as I mentioned, this is a very important article regarding your mains preparation. So pay attention and note each and every point and revise it for your mains examination. So these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See, take a look at this article which says, Cheetahs have been moved from the quarantine zone to the larger enclosure in the Kuno National Park. Now many of you may be reminiscing about the video when our Prime Minister introduced cheetahs into the wild. Yes, exactly about these cheetahs only the article is speaking. So to understand why quarantine zone was needed, we need to know about the reintroduction of species in India and few facts about the Kuno National Park. See let me first explain what I mean by reintroduction. 
Reintroduction is the intentional movement and release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it has disappeared. This means that particular species used to be present in that range but it went extinct due to threats. Such a species is called the focal species because it is the species that is focused on. Okay. But why reintroduction is needed? Because it aims to re-establish a viable population of the focal species within its indigenous range. One factor to note here is reintroduction is not only a conservation strategy for the threatened species but also a strategy to restore the ecosystem functions. See for example, according to the Indian government, cheetah happens to be the only large carnivore animal that got completely wiped out from the India, that is which went extinct. Why it went extinct is because of the threats like overhunting and habitat loss. So cheetahs used to be present in India but now they are extinct. Therefore, reintroduction efforts are being taken. One such effort is the drafting of the action plan for introduction of cheetahs in India. This action plan is drafted under the project Cheetah. You would have heard that project Cheetah is world's first intercontinental large wild carnivore translocation project. It aims to reintroduce 50 cheetahs in various national parks of India over 5 years. See, do you know which were the former cheetah ranger states of India? This includes Gujarat, Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh. So these states have been prioritized for reintroduction of cheetahs as per the plan. Among the sites that were surveyed, only few were recommended for holding and conservation breeding of cheetah in India. That too in controlled wild conditions. These sites include Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh, Navradehi Wildlife Sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh, then Gandhi Sagar Wildlife Sanctuary in Madhya Pradesh, then Shagar Balch in Jaisalmer of Rajasthan and finally the Muguntara Tiger Reserve in Rajasthan. Among these sites also, the Kuno National Park has been given the first priority. But the question is why? See, Kuno National Park situated in Madhya Pradesh is an area of about 748 square kilometer. And it forms part of the Shiopur Shiopuri deciduous open forest landscape of Madhya Pradesh. The important fact to be noted is it is devoid of human settlements. We know that with the presence of humans other than the indigenous tribal populations, slowly the development projects creep in, which will damage the ecosystem. But even the tribal population is not present in Kuno. Why? Because Kuna is probably the only wildlife site in the country where there has been a complete relocation of villages from inside the park. Okay. So currently it has a suitable habitat and adequate prey base for the cheetahs to survive. Due to these habitat and prey conditions, the survey has estimated that Kuno has the capacity to sustain 21 cheetahs. Not only that, such conditions of Kuno also offers the prospect of housing the four big cats of India and allows them to coexist like in the past. The four big cats I am referring is the tiger, lion, leopard and cheetah. Okay. So considering these conducive conditions offered by Kuno National Park, Project Cheetah began introducing cheetahs. That is, under the project, in September 2022, eight cheetahs were brought to India from Namibia. See, I want to clarify one fact here. If you notice, even though I gave explanation for reintroduction, I am saying introduction here. This is because the cheetah from Namibia is an African cheetah and not Asiatic cheetah. Because Asiatic cheetah only was present in India. Okay, so expert says that, the recent arrival of cheetahs to India is nothing but the introduction of cheetahs under the project cheetah. So it would be incorrect to say reintroduction here. Understood? So in addition to that, know that the cheetahs were quarantined after their arrival in India. During such quarantine, cheetahs were monitored for manifestation of any sickness. See, this is a required action as per the regulation of import of live animals under the Livestock Importation Act 1898. 
Also note that they were quarantined for a required period in a predator proof enclosure at the site of release. What I am talking here? Yes, it is about the Kuno National Park. Such quarantine also helps the species in many ways. For example, the male and females are kept in separate but adjoining compartments. This helps them to know each other before a full release to the wild. Such quarantine enclosure also enables them to see for some distance to understand the environment and the presence of prey and predators before release. Since natural prey is present within the enclosure, it ensures that cheetah becomes accustomed to hunting Indian prey species before their release. Okay. Then since these many actions are done prior to release into wild, such a release is called soft release. On the other hand, if they are suddenly released into unfamiliar environments, it is called hard release. See, evidence suggests that soft release method generally has a significantly lower mortality in comparison with hard release as it ameliorates stresses associated with the sudden release into unfamiliar environments. Okay, so that is why now two more cheetahs have been moved to a larger enclosure from the quarantine enclosure. Okay. So that's all regarding this news article. See, be clear with what is reintroduction and what is introduction and what is done under Project Cheetah. Also note that the term soft release and hard release. If you know this much, it's much more enough for attending preliminary type of questions. Okay, I had given you much more explanations other than this because you need to understand what are these terms. That is why I had given a clear explanation here. Okay. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion. See today we have 5 questions in which 3 I will be discussing and 2 will be a quiz question for you. See those 2 quiz questions also is clearly discussed in the news article discussion itself. If you had keenly observed the discussion then it is very easy for you to give the answer for those questions. And aspirants I expect you all to comment your answers in the comment section. And the correct answer will also be posted in the comment section itself. See this is really going to boost your prelims preparation. So do try it. Now let's see the first question. See it is a map based question. And here they are asking which of the following states are sharing border with Bangladesh. Before attempting this question just look at this map here. I had shown in this map which are the states that are bordering Bangladesh. Go through it once and then try to answer this question. Now what is the answer for this question? Yes. It is option B, 2, 3 and 4 only because Sikkim is not bordering Bangladesh. What are the other states that are bordering Bangladesh? Yes, they are Assam, West Bengal, Mizoram, Meghalaya and Tripura. Okay. See, likewise, know the bordering states for the neighboring countries. It is really helpful for your prelims preparation. Okay. Now moving on to the second question. It is regarding Project Cheetah. Here two statements are given and you are asked to find the correct statement. Okay. Now look at statement 1. It envisages to introduce 50 cheetahs in various Indian national parks over 10 years. See this statement is incorrect because 50 cheetahs are to be introduced in 5 years. As of now this is the plan. Okay. Not 10 years. And coming to the statement 2. In 2022, cheetahs from Iran were introduced in Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh. See, this statement is also incorrect. As the cheetahs were brought from Namibia, which are African cheetahs, particularly South African cheetahs. Okay. But you should also know the significance of Iran here because the locally extinct cheetah subspecies of India is found in Iran and is categorized as critically endangered. Okay. See, since it is not possible to source the critically endangered Asiatic cheetah from Iran without affecting the subspecies, India desired to source cheetahs from South Africa. And they can provide India with substantial numbers of suitable cheetah for several years. Okay. See, cheetahs know from Southern Africa have the maximum observed genetic diversity among extant cheetah lineages. An important attribute for a founding population stock. Okay. And moreover, the southern African cheetahs are found to be ancestral to all the other cheetah lineages including those found in Iran. Hence, this was considered to be ideal for India's reintroduction program. Okay. So now what is the answer for this question? Since the question is demanding for correct statements, both statements are wrong here. So your answer here will be option D, neither 1 nor 2. 
Now moving on to see the third question. See here also two statements are given. So let us move on to the first statement. A tripartite agreement between India, Nepal and Britain provides for enlisting Gurkhas in the British or Indian armies. This statement is correct. See the tripartite agreement between the government of India, Nepal and Britain was signed on 9th of November 1947. Yes, after India's independence. But even before that, the Gorkhas were enrolled to the British Army. But this agreement provided a legal basis. As per the agreement, Gorkhas are eligible to be enlisted in the British and Indian armies. Some sources say that as per the tripartite agreement, 6 of the 10 regiments remained as part of the Indian Army while 4 joined the British Army. Since then, the Indian Army regularly recruits Gurkhas from Nepal with special vacancies. Also, more than 1.2 lakh Gurkha regiments pensioners are residing in Nepal. The government of India has made every effort to ensure that these pensioners, their families and dependents are looked after in the best possible manner. Now moving on to see the second statement. Gurkhas were part of the British Army during the First World War. This statement is also correct. Seeing the valor of Gurkhas, no, the British decided to enroll them into the British Army. So, Gurkhas were part of the British Army during the First World War. It is said that during the First World War, over 2 lakh Gurkhas were enrolled into the British Army. Okay? Now, coming back to the question, it is demanding for correct statements. So, your answer here will be option C, both 1 and 2 are correct. So, through all these 3 questions, we discuss 3 different topics and that becomes really useful for your preliminary preparation. Now, moving on to see the quiz question. See, displayed here are two quiz questions for you. If you are keenly observed to the discussion, it is going to be very much useful and it is very much easy for you to answer this question. Okay. And displayed here are two mains practice questions. See, this is also regarding our discussion only. If you had observed the discussion, try writing answer for these questions. It is going to help you in your mains preparation. Okay. And that's all for today's discussion. If you like this video, do like, share and comment and don't forget to subscribe to the Shankar IAS Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.